Okay, so I'm off to Bucharest in a week's time uh, to spend a year working on a research project which is basically called the Ethics of Investigation, Treating Conspiracy Theories Seriously, in which I'm looking at the issue of why should we treat conspiracy theories seriously in our policy. And in part, this is a kind of sequel to my PhD in book, The Philosophy of Conspiracy Theories, where I develop a case for saying, look, we need to be able to evaluate conspiracy theories on the evidence rather than simply dismiss them out of hand because they are these things we call conspiracy theories. Now, when I was working on my PhD, Charles Pigton uh, spent a lot of time telling me that I need to also work on when we should investigate these claims. It's not enough to simply say we can evaluate conspiracy theories on the evidence. We also need to know when we should actually go and investigate any speculative claim of conspiracy we hear about in public discourse. And so basically, I am going to take Charles's suggestion and go away to Bucharest and work on this. So this talk is very much a promissory note. This is a discussion about the things I'm going to be working on on the next year, over the next year, and in part it's a discussion of a set of papers that I'm obliged to produce whilst I'm in Bucharest. So there may be a lot of questions in this, and there may not be so many answers because I'm at the beginning of my pathway of discovering these answers, and hopefully in the question time you'll give me some guidance as to where I should go and also where I shouldn't go. But let's talk about the issue. Why should we take conspiracy theories seriously? After all, one of the things that came out in the previous discussion uh, after David's talk was that there are an awful lot of conspiracy theories in general discourse. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of conspiracy theories making their way through the news media, Reddit, 4chan and the like at any particular moment. And many of these conspiracy theories seem absolutely ludicrous. They seem like the kind of thing that no ordinary person should actually believe. And yet, in part, some of these claims of conspiracy turn out to be true. So what are we meant to do in the situation where there are so many conspiracy theories and so little time for any of us to work on them? And the worry gets compounded by the fact that we are told that there are social consequences to conspiracy theorising existing in our polities. So we're told, for example, uh, by Karen D Douglas and Jolly, that people who suspect conspiracies are simply the kind of people who would engage in conspiracies themselves. So conspiracy theorists are simply people who have a kind of mindset, well, I would conspire, ipso facto other people would conspire, therefore the world is filled with conspiracies, well, thus we should suspect there are conspiracies going on at the highest echelons of government. Or, as Douglas uh, put out in an opt-ed last year, conspiracy theories present a clear and present danger to the pulse. And we're told the consequences of belief in conspiracy theories can lead to a lack of trust in democratic systems, increased suspicion that conspiracies are occurring, and another mm. of other social ills. And if we get, want to get specific, uh, we've got Jovan By Byford. He claims that conspiracy theorists mistakenly see the world as a product of successive and successful conspiracies. Uh, Michael J. Wood and Karen M. Douglas claim that conspiracy theorists typically are more interested in disputing rival theories than they are promoting their own conspiracy theories. Robert Brotherton and Christopher C. French claim that conspiracy theories are an unverified and relatively implausible allegation of conspiracy. And in a recent op-ed in Le Monde, Gerald Bonner et al. say conspiracy theories are a threat to civil society and we must develop a science to combat them. Now those are all social scientists. We can all also add in a whole bunch of philosophers who have also talked about the ills of conspiracy theories. You've got Karl Popper who claims, look, conspiracies are rare and seldom successful and so conspiracy theories are just unlikely. Uh, Steve Clark? No, no, I've, I've retracted that claim. Yes, I, actually, I, actually was, I actually was going to mention that, but thank you for noting that. Who in 2002, uh, this, is, this, is, this is the issue of always talking about philosophers when they're in the room. There's a very famous story about Thomas Kuhn, who attended a talk about his own philosophy, where a bunch of grad students described 
Kuhnian re uh, research paradigms and the like, and then Thomas Kuhn stood up and said, no, that's not true. That's not, that's not what I said. So it's a fairly common thing. Uh, so Steve Clark, who yeah, in 2002? That is what I said. Yes, I know, I know. And I was going to note that people have changed their minds. Uh, so we'll, we'll just leave Steve out of this for the time being. Uh, Peter Lipton, who's dead and thus cannot actually uh, <laughs> interfere at this point in time. Conspiracy theories are lovely but unlikely. Uh, Pete Mandick. Where there is conflict between an official theory of the type shit happens, great paper just for the sheer fact it's called shit happens, you very rarely get a chance to use the word shit in the title of any paper, truth be told. Uh, and so, so is unless you're de 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 dealing with fossilised faecal matter. Uh, then we have no good reason to prefer the conspiracy theory. And most recently, Kassam Kwasam, conspiracy theorists suffer from the epistemic vice of gullibility. So we're told there are lots and lots of ills to conspiracy theorizing. But what's really interesting is that many of these, what David might call conspiracy baiters, uh, what I would call conspiracy theory skeptics, is that they're willing to admit that conspiracies actually do occur. None of them are willing to bite the bullet and say, look, conspiracies don't occur. They all go, well, conspiracies do occur, but at the same time, they're either unlikely or they tend to be discovered, so thus suspicion about conspiracy theories in the polis is the kind of thing that we have a prima facie case against. Now, in the words of Joel Bunting and Jason Taylor, this is basically the thesis of generalism, where generalism is some claim about being able to talk about the class of conspiracy theories generally, and then saying, look, we can make claims about that class, which means that we can make claims about belief in conspiracy theories gen generally, and we don't need to worry so much about the particulars of each th theory. And generalists, and this was actually a point that David made, he's actually managed to preempt a lot of what I was going to talk about in this particular talk, uh, make claims like such, if there was a conspiracy going on, we would know about it because there's a tendency for conspiracies to leak, or there are sufficient checks and balances in our particular Western societies that mean that people just don't get away with acting conspiratorially. Now we can contrast the generalist case with that of the particularist. And the particularist says, look, when you hear any particular claim of conspiracy, you need to assess that claim of conspiracy on its evidential merits. So you can't infer from the general class of these things that we might call conspiracy theories that any given conspiracy theory is going to be unlikely because there have been lots of examples where people have said, well, that just seems like an unlikely conspiracy theory, but when that conspiracy theory was investigated, it turned out to be warranted, or many years down the track, what was called a conspiracy theory at the time information comes out to show that actually it was rational to believe it at the time and it was simply tarred with this label of being a conspiracy theory caused by vapid conspiracy theorizing believed by vapid conspiracists. And particularism seems to be an increasingly common position in philosophy at the moment. Uh, so particulars such as Charles Pigden, Brian L. Keeley, Lee Basham, David Cody, who may decide to disagree with me on his classifying him as a particularist, uh, Joel Bunting and Jason Taylor, and myself, have all argued to a very large extent that when you hear some claim about a conspiracy, the only way to work out whether it's warranted or unwarranted is to actually grapple with the evidence for or against that particular claim of conspiracy. You can't infer from the fact it's called a conspiracy theory that it's something which is irrational to believe. You need to actually spend some time in the pits, by and large, actually engaging with the theory, looking at the evidence, and then deciding whether it's warranted on that evidence, or it's the kind of thing we're right to be suspicious of, or whether it's just outright false. And this notion of particularism has been pushed by a lot of people, Charles Pigden, and this is a summary which has been ably put forward by David Cody, and I think in What to Believe Now, this is a paraphrase thereof. Unless you believe the reports of the history books and nightly news are largely false, you turn out to be a conspiracy theorist. If you do believe the reports of history books and nightly news are largely false, 
Then you turn out to be a conspiracy theorist. Conclusion, because of the horns of the dilemma, we're all conspiracy th th theorists. Uh, and this is a point also being pushed by Lee Basham in a recent reply to a pa paper I wrote, uh, The Need for Accountable Witnesses, who says, look, humans are innately good at tactical deception. Humans are good at coordinating with one another. Humans are good at being secretive. By and large, conspiring is something that we do easily and naturally. Why would we assume that this isn't going on everywhere in our society? We do it on a day-to-day -day basis with our friends. We do it on a week-to-week -week basis in our departmental meetings. Uh, business leaders do it on a month-by-month -month basis when they're engaging in product launches or hiding the fact that some product is faulty. Why not assume that people in the echelons of government are also acting like the rest of us? What's so special about the governmental system that we think that they're not conspiring just like every one of us is on a day-to-day -day basis? Now, there's a whole bunch of attendant issues you can have when you are a particularist. So particulars are not necessar necessarily in agreement with every aspect of discussion about conspiracy theories. Some people will say, well, look, known conspiracies aren't really the topic of these things we call conspiracy theories. We're dealing here with the class of things which are unverified. Uh, there's a, another debate which asks just how generalizable is the notion of a conspiracy? So is the organization of a surprise party for a five-year-old or a friend who's leaving the country? keep trying to point out to people back home, I'm leaving for Bucharest soon. It would be great if someone organised me a, a surprise party before I went. Well, that, would that also count as a conspiracy? For the sheer fact, it would be something undertaken in secret. You don't want the person leaving for Bucharest to know a party is being organised. And it has a particular goal, which is either making sure that person leaves the country and never comes back, or the person has a really good time to remember they have good friends back in Auckland. But particularists, by and large, talk about the idea that we need to work with a fairly general, minimal definition that tells us what these things called conspiracies are and how they apply to these things called conspiracy theories. Because if we end up artificially restricting the definition of what counts as a conspiracy or what counts as a conspiracy theory, we have the problem that by artificially restricting the scope, we end up making the things we're talking about seem unlikely. And thus that pushes us into the pejorative camp of saying, well, look, these things are unlikely, therefore it's justified in us being suspicious about them. Well, so if we look at all the things which are covered by the rubric of this thing called conspiracy, and all these theories about these things called conspiracies, then we have a much better chance of actually judging whether A, belief in conspiracy theories is rational, and B, whether belief in individual conspiracy theories is actually going to be any good. And the other issue here is that the generalist ends up having a whole bunch of really strange bedfellows. I'll skip over Cass Sunstein and Adrian Vermeule for the sheer fact that David has done an admirable job of covering the particular issue that they put forward and focus a little bit more on the conservative writer Andrew Sullivan. Uh, he wrote a piece at the beginning of 2016 which has the wonderful title, Democracies End When They Are Too Democratic and Right Now America Is a Breeding Ground for Tyranny, at which point he basically argues that, look, democracy is a really, really bad idea because people get to have opinions. And basically, the people who should have opinions are political insiders. Political insiders know how politics works, and they know how politics is meant to work. And as long as you trust that political insiders are looking out for the public good, we really should restrict the franchise to only those who are qualified to make decisions of this particular in import. So restrict the franchise and make sure that only people who are in the know are the ones who have any weight in our political system. And these types of claims are the types of claims that, when people read about them, tend to foster belief in conspiracies. So if you are the kind of person who reads Cass Sunstein and Adrian Vermeule's paper, 
uh, causes and cures, and you read about the cognitive infiltra infiltration of conspiracy fora, your first thought should be, so you want to conspire against the conspiracy theorists. If the conspiracy theorists find out you're conspiring against them, surely they're going to have a warranted belief that there's a conspiracy out to get them. And if they believe that, surely they're going to be going, what else is the government doing trying to quash dissent in this manner? In the same respect, if you decide to restrict the franchise to only the political insiders who know what's going on, well, surely the history of our political systems shows that people at the very top of the political hierarchy don't always act in our own best interest. In many situations, they actually act against the best interest of the public and often for the best interest of themselves. So we need to make a decision which kind of society or world do we live in? And then if you're saying, well, historically political insiders have been self-serving, surely restricting the franchise to only them is the kind of thing that makes you think there's probably going to be a lot of infighting and conspiring in those political insiders as they go after their own particular agendas. And as I'll touch on briefly, that was one of the reasons why the first glorious French Revolution happened due to the opening up of what was happening in the French royal court, making the bourgeoisie in Paris go, we really did think that Louis was actually after our best interest, but it turns out he has no control of the court, and if he has no control of the court, we can now explain why things are so bad by the fact it's actually backstabbing a conspiracy by court insiders trying to get audiences with the emperor. <clears throat> Now, what's also interesting, as mentioned before, is that the Sullivan, Sunsteins, and Vermeules of this world are aware that conspiracies occur. So they're quite happy to say, look, there are lots of conspiracies. Some of those conspiracies have had drastic effects within the world. So they're not even saying, look, there are lots of conspiracy theories, some of which are true. They're willing to say that there are lots of conspiracies operating at all levels of society some of which have had drastic effect, but they would rather we dismiss talk of conspiracy theories because of the ill effect it has on the people's, oh, sorry, on the policy's reputation and the people's feeling towards it. And yet, surely if there is some conspiracy going on within our political system, we, are the, we should be concerned about it. It is the kind of thing which presumably may well pose a direct threat to us or other people within the polis. So if there is a conspiracy going on, surely we need to do something about it. Because they are a kind of threat. And that gets me on to my particular project. So I have four questions I want to lo look at whilst I'm in Bucharest. Uh, one, when is it rational for citizens to trust officials? So generally, what is the kind of political situation we're in that when an official makes a declaration or an assertion or some kind of guidance for public policy, we should go, yes, that is the kind of person we should listen to and they are acting in our best interest. What kind of political culture and what kind of social arrangements would ensure that it is on the whole rational for citizens to trust politicians and others acting in a political, political capacity? So what should society look like in such a way that we can actually trust what's going on at all levels? Three, when is it rational for journalists and others to take conspiracy theories seriously and even investigate them? So what is our epistemic burden in this society? So do we expect investigative journalists to do all the work of investigating claims of conspiracy or public prosecutors or the police? Or is there a role for citizen journalists in our society to play that role? Or are we expected to spend our entire night and day investigating every claim we read on a Reddit thread to work out whether there's a conspiracy going on or not? Exactly what arrangements are there generally and interpersonally for working out what we do when we hear a claim of conspiracy. And four, and this is the one which I find actually the most interesting, could it be rational to take a conspiracy theory seriously even when it's not rational to believe it? So what do we make of David Icke's alien, reptile, shape-shifting, hybrid hypothesis? Uh, now, I've actually sat through two David Icke talks 
Uh, David Icke doesn't give a one-hour talk. David Icke gives a full 12-hour, full-day David Icke experience. I've sat through two of them. Uh, both times, I've suffered because of it, not just mentally. The first talk I went to that David Icke gave, I sprained my ankle the day before. So I spent the entire day trying to manoeuvre around a chair to work out the most comfortable way to sit there whilst David Icke was describing his rather weird epistemology and metaphysical views. Uh, the last talk I gave, which, uh, last talk I gave, I'm David Icke. Last talk David Icke gave, sorry, I should actually remove the mask at this point. Um, <laughs> The last talk Dave David Ike gave, which was a month ago, I managed to get the most horrendous head cold. So I started off with a small scratch in the back of my throat and a slight headache. And then by the end of the day, I was shivering, thinking I was going to die. And I was with a friend who promised me that if it looked like I was about to collapse, he would drag me up onto the stage so I could collapse in front of David Ike. And then they would claim I went out the way I always wanted to in worship of the great. David Icke. Uh, and actually what's interesting about going to a David Icke talk is that A, he's an amazing public speaker. Two, he can talk for 10 hours straight without flagging in any way, shape or form. And three, his views are not as crazy as maybe they're made out to be. He's got a weird epistemology, so he has a really weird way of getting information about the world. But it's a fairly consistent one. There's a consistency in his thought that indicates that he's wrong, but he's wrong in a really interesting way. And I've spent a lot of time grappling with this, having spent 20 hours with the man and also having interviewed him for a podcast. So yes, I'm interested in these particular, qu these particular questions. And so what I want to do now is just very briefly talk about two particular issues. One relates to the fourth question, when is it rational to treat a conspiracy theory seriously, even if it seems unbelievable? And the other is a point which has been pushed by Lee Basham and Brian L. Keeley, which is the problem of hierarchies and where we get information in the polis from. Because even though we live in a Western democracy, we still live in a highly hierarchical society. We live in a society where power basically is vested at the top, and officials and scientists, we have to include them in this particular hierarchy, philosophers, academic elites, psychologists, social scientists, and the like, live in a position of privilege, make declarations and emanations, and that information trickles down to the populace. Uh, so two days ago, I learnt from a local newspaper in Adelaide that if you're the kind of person who drinks gin, you are likely to be a psychopath. Apparently, liking gin is correlated to psychopathic behavioural traits. And this was being put forward in the newspaper as being the latest finding from the sciences. I suspect in a few weeks' time, there will be a quiet retraction on page three, indicating that it's actually not a particularly good, as you know, page two. It's always, it's always the even num numbered page that embarrassing attractions have to be made because it will turn out that actually the study has been looked at and people don't think much of it. But we get these declarations and people treat them seriously, whether they be from politicians or from scientific elites. And the question is, how do we evaluate the information which emanates from such hierarchies? And that leads to an important question. Because to understand how we evaluate claims that emanate from hierarchies, we have actually already have to have a prior judgment about just how conspired or unconspired our world actually looks. And so in a recent paper, when inferring to a conspiracy might be the best explanation, I advanced the argument that whilst we can't make a definitive statement about how conspired or unconspired our world appears to be, what we can do is show that most people's intuitions about the conspired nature of our society seriously underestimates the level of conspiratorial activity that's happening all over the show. So most of us underplay the chance of conspiracy in the polis, and yet numerous examples show that conspiracies are much more likely than most of us tend to think. Now, if you live in a highly conspired world, of course you're going to be on the lookout for conspiracies. Because in a highly conspired world, you know conspiracies are happening all around you. 
And thus, either you're going to live in complete apathy, there's nothing I can do, or you're going to live in a state of vigilance, going, well, I know there are conspiracies going on. Are they conspiring? Are they conspiring? And you will see conspiracies everywhere. And sometimes you'll be right, and sometimes you'll be wrong, depending on how well the conspirators are actually doing their particular business. And of course, you can live in a low conspiracy world where conspiracies are very rare. But the problem with information hierarchies, as Lee Basham has pointed out, is that in a world which looks like it's relatively unconspired, if there's a hierarchy in existence, it's quite possible the hierarchy is doing a really good job of making sure you're not aware of the conspiracies they're engaged in. Now, there are kind of two options here, one of which is the open society in which we live, in which people at the top control the flow of information and produce a kind of disinformation campaign to make sure you think you live in an unconspired world. Or you have the, French, uh, the ancient regime prior to the French re revolution, where people are simply making assumptions about the royal court. So, in 1781, the finance minister, Jacques Necker, published for the first time the accounts of the royal court of the Aishon regime. Prior to that point in time, there were no royal accounts that anyone could go and look at. But Jacques Necker, who came from Switzerland, decided he wanted to open the government up and show the people how responsible the court was doing. The problem was, the books were cooked. So Jacques Necker had spent a large amount of time making sure that the royal accounts looked flush when there was a cash flow problem in France at that particular point in time. The problem was this book was published en masse in Paris and the bourgeoisie, who were fascinated by the internal politicking of the French royal court, bought these books en masse. It's a little bit like when the Warren Commission report for JFK came out, which no one thought anyone was going to read, and then sold like hotcakes. And like the Warren Commission report, people spent a lot of time agonising over the details and started to spot numerous inconsistencies, which showed that Nicker had moved money from one account to another account at particular points in time to make accounts look big when they were small. And actually, if you did the books yourself, the Paris Royal Court was basically bankrupt at that particular point in time. But the other thing which was fascinating about the Comte de Ridou au Roy, my French is so wonderful, I'm sure that will pass, uh, was that people were fascinated by Necker's description of how you got funding for your particular activities through the French court. And it wasn't you go to Louis and say, Louis, I wish to increase the agricultural subsidies to make sure that people can eat with abandon. It was a case of, first of all, find two people you don't like, tell them as being suspicious individuals, torpedo their particular funding requests, and then once their funding requests are, find another person who has a bill that they want to get through, approach the, the, the emperor, get your funding allocated, stab the other person in the back, take all the money yourself, keep 80% of it, and then spend 20% on the material you actually want done. And so what we had here was not just cooked books, but it was a description of the conspiratorial nature of the government. And so nine years later, you have the French, actually no, it's, uh, sorry, six years later, the beginning of the French re revolution starts as more and more inspection of the royal court goes on and the bourgeoisie go, this is not a satisfactory form of government. We thought they were acting in our interest. Actually, they're just conspirators doing their conspiratorial business. So our understanding of hierarchies is crucial for understanding how conspired we think the world is. And our understanding of how conspired the world is affects our judgment as to exactly what we should be doing as individual citizens in appraising claims of conspiracy in the polis. It also explains to a certain extent our reactions to conspiratorial claims. So you'll be aware at the moment that there's an election going on in the US. Uh, there are two contenders. There's this unknown business person by the name of Donald Trump and a hitherto unheard of senator by the name of Hillary Clinton. And it's getting fairly messy. So turns out that Senator Clinton, when she was Secretary of State, 
decided to run a private email server for all of her correspondence needs, which turns out to not be the done thing. Members of the White House are meant to use the White House email servers at all time to make sure that freedom of information access requests can be answered. And Clinton seemed to find a way around that by making her emails completely private. Now, the reaction to Senator Clinton's email server issue has been interesting. Democrats, by and large, go, well, you know, she didn't do anything bad. I mean, it was a silly idea running a private email server, but, you know, she's a generally good person, so she wasn't really engaged in conspiring against the people. It was just a bad decision. Well, his opponents of Senator Clinton, mostly Republicans, some Libertarians, and presumably a few people in the Green Party, have got, no, that was a bad thing, because we actually really don't know what was happening at the time. There are at least 14,000 missing emails covering the period while she was Secretary of State. You have to suspect that maybe she used a private e email server so she could say and do things that she didn't want anyone to know about. And so our judgment about the conspired nature of the American political system affects our notion of whether we think particular conspiracy theories about individuals in that system are going to be warranted or unwarranted. So hierarchies are obviously an issue that need to be grappled with to work out what our particular role in investigating conspiracy theories are going to be. Then there's the unthinkable. Imagine you've heard stories that the police and upper echelons of government are engaged in a massive conspiracy to hide the existence of high-profile pedophiles in your society. So just imagine this. Now, this seems unthinkable, because that kind of thing wouldn't happen. People wouldn't cover up a cadre of pedophiles working at the highest echelons of society, because who would, who would even think of doing that. And if people thought about doing that, surely the information would leak. There's no way you'd be able to keep the secret for 10, 20 or 30 years. There's no way people would engage in that level of conspiracy to keep such a horrific thing from pu public sight. And the other problem is it, it occurred. Uh, so this is basically the result of the investigation into the rather macabre activities of one Jimmy Savile, a children's entertainer who turned out to be a pedophile and a necrophile, uh, who once he was investigated, they discovered there were a number of other members of the British celebrity fraternity and also members of the political establishment who were also engaging in similar activities. Complaints had been made to the police and the government of the day, and the police and the government of the day had at the very worst, sorry, the very best, uh, dismissed those claims, and at the very worst, actively made sure that no long-term investigations of these claims would occur in British society. And the evidence from Operation Newtree indicates the latter. It was a conspiracy by members of the establishment to try and make sure that no one would find out about what was happening because it would be gravely embarrassing to the government and its friends if these stories ever came out. And there are numerous other examples of a similar nature. The Moscow show trials of the 1930s were rather conclusively shown to be mock trials by the Dewey Commission in about 1937, 1938, but only admitted to being a conspiracy when Nikita Khrushchev took the chair of the Communist Party and went, yeah, basically the Dewey Commission was right and I had nothing to do with it whatsoever. It was all Stalin's fault. Uh, the Gulf of Tonkin incident in 1964, and of course the conspiracy theorist, theory theorist's favourite, Watergate, all examples of things that were called conspiracy theories at the time, good evidence to show that they were in fact warranted beliefs about conspiratorial actions, and yet dismissed because they were conspiracy theories, or because they were unthinkable, and no one would do that kind of thing, they would never get away with it. And yet time and time again, they do, because they do not get investigated at the time they're meant to. They get dismissed as merely being conspiracy theories. Now, what my particular project is about is trying to get some guidance on what we ought to do 
when we hear these claims of conspiracy. So I would like to think I've literally written the book on appraising conspiracy theories on their evidence. And this is the point where I'd normally give a sales pitch to buy my book, but my book is incredibly expensive, and thus I have no expectation that you will buy the book individually, but I would recommend you ask your research institution to purchase a copy of The Philosophy of Conspiracy Theories, published 2014 by Palgrave Macmillan. It'll probably make me an additional $5 in royalties next year, which is really serious moolah when you're in the business of writing academically. But the issue is, how do we investigate these things? And more importantly, what is our individual role? So if we ignore the fact that many, of this, many people in this room are academics, what is the role of the individual in our society when they hear a claim of conspiracy? Are we able to trust people in the information hierarchies above us? Or are we obliged to investigate each and every individual claim ourselves? Now, it can't be the latter. It can't be that David has to, on his own, wake up each morning, go on 4chan, look at all the lists of all the feminist conspiracy theories and claims about Gamergate, and then spend his entire morning going through with a checklist and go, yep, warranted, unwarranted, unwarranted, surprisingly warranted, unwarranted. Oh, I wasn't a wicker about that. Because it wouldn't take him all morning. It would take him the rest of his life to investigate these claims. So does David then claim, well, Matthew, you have to take on this task as well. Together we'll sit down, we'll both go through the list. Or does he expect everyone in this room to be doing their particular bit? And if we're all doing our particular bit, is there a kind of expectation that some of us do particular bits and other people others? So for example, I'm no climatologist. When it comes to looking at claims about anthropogenic climate change either being the gravest threat to humanity or a conspiracy by the Russians to put us under Russian control under the guise of a green movement, turns out when, it looks at, when, I, when I look at the comple complex mathematical models associated with these claims, I'm not in a position to work out whether they're good or bad and how the claims work out. And I'm certainly not in a position to uh, to make an argument as to why climatologists believe one thing and yet atmospheric physicists often believe another thing. So if you actually look at the University of Auckland, you have prominent atmospheric physicists who will claim actually climate change is not what it's made out to be. It's a fundamentally flawed model and we can show mathematically why. And climatologists at the same university will say, actually, no, they're using older models. The more updated models explain this particular thing. So what is the epistemic burden here for sorting out claims of that particular type? Because we can't do it on our own. There needs to be ethical, because I think there's a kind of moral obligation to investigate these claims, and epistemic guidance, what are you meant to do and how do you go about it, to work out how we deal with these claims of conspiracy within the world. And that basically is my promissory note of the work I'll be doing over the next year. So I apologize if there's no groundbreaking claims here I've made, but I'm hoping in a year's time, you're going to hold another workshop in, in a year's time, surely I'll be back with a whole suite of exciting answers as to how we investigate conspiracy theories, how we share that epistemic and ethical load, and how we actually judge the kind of world in which we live. But until then, I must leave you. Thanks, Matthew. So, um, could you tell me more about particularism? Because there seem to be a couple of claims going on. If I, I, I just want to get, make sure I've got them right. So, so early on you started saying we should um, investigate each theory on its merits, and that, so that was particularism. So I want to know if that means we should disregard what we think about other conspiracy theories when uh, assessing particular conspiracy theories, because that was the claim. And later on there was more about like an ethical claim that we should investigate all the conspiracy theories. So, so, Maybe you could just tell me which, which claims you're committed to. All right, so I think if you're in, interested in particularism from an epistemic stance, 
then what you know about other conspiracy theories may be slightly informative about aspects of a particular conspiracy theory you encounter in the wild. But those claims about other conspiracy theories don't tell you whether the particular conspiracy theory is warranted or unwarranted. The only way to make that judgment is to investigate the evidential merits of that theory and either find it lacking, ambivalent, or positive. So a, that's the epistemic case for particularism. The ethical... So, so, so yeah. just early on, you said that they may be relevant, the, the other theories. So I think you can take... You can take some claims about other conspiracy theories you've encountered in, in the past, which you might put under a rubric, oh, that belongs within the group of truther hypotheses. Normally, truther hypotheses have the following form, and there are particular types of evidence that we know get associated with these hypotheses that make it then easier to go through the epistemic process of adjudicating whether the particular claim is true. But you can still only work out whether the particular conspiracy theory is good or bad by judging it on its own merits. Other associated claims with the group it might belong to might make that process faster or easier, but you still have to assess the theory on its own merits. So I th if I'm talking in general terms there, it's only about you might use group similarities to help you in the process of assessing the particulars. So, so I can make a kind of prima facie assessment this theory is bad because some other truth or theory was bad. No, so I don't think you can go that far. I think you can go, I, I can make a claim about the kind of evidence it will use, mm -hmm. but until I investigate it, I can't actually say it's using that particular kind of evidence. You might hear, so for example, you might hear a particular conspiracy theory about 9-11, uh, which says the planes were flown by remote control into the Twin Towers. Oh yes, I've heard that one before. It belongs to the group of radio-controlled planes or hologrammatic drone vehicles that looked like 747s. What I'm going to expect is actually they're going to talk about radio frequencies, altitude, uh, the lack of body parts, the convenience of particular debris falling down, and, and the like. All right, now let's go and actually look at this particular claim. Oh, actually, it turns out this claim is completely different from any 9-11 radio-controlled plane hypothesis I've ever seen in the past. But that was interesting. I thought they would use this particular type of evidence, which I may or may not have opinions upon. But actually, it turns out it's a new claim, and I have to assess it on its evidential merits, as I would have done in the former case. I just would have had some shortcuts there to work out what's going on. Okay, so, sorry, I know Keep on this. No, no, no. It is, it's, it's, a, it is an important distinction. I agree. You did say something later on. You, um, you asked about whether we're in a high conspiracy or low conspiracy world. Yeah. And it kind of sounded like this was going to be important information for determining whether conspiracy theories are more likely to be true or not. So, um, if I understood what was going on there, that seemed to undercut the. Right, so if I phrase it in that particular way, or that general way, uh, then that's a mistake on my part. I'm talking there about the initial approach to investigation. So whilst I think that if you're an epistemic particularist about conspiracy theories, you can only say a conspiracy theory is good or bad, warranted or unwarranted by judging it on its evidence, there is the issue here that as an individual, I hear, and I do hear because I do podcasts, I do talks and things, I hear a lot of conspiracy theories every single day. And I've got, I've got gut reactions to a whole bunch of those theories. Yes, I've heard a variation of that before, I think it's likely to be untrue. Yes, I've heard a variation of that, that seems quite pl plausible. And that decides what I'm going to investigate next. So I'm not making any judgment at that point that I think the claim is actually true or false or warranted or unwarranted. It's basically at that point a, hmm, I've got a limited amount of time, so I can only spend some time investigating a conspiracy theory as opposed to cooking my dinner, teaching a class, or reading a book. So I thought, so I thought there was a claim earlier on about whether we are or are not in a high conspiracy world. Yes, and so, and so that... It's not evidentially relevant to assessing the likelihood of conspiracy. 
It is, but it still doesn't tell you whether any particular conspiracy theory is, is going to be warranted or unwarranted. It simply gives you some guidance into that investigative process. Right. So, so it's having like particularism is being un progressively undermined because more and more general information is being stuffed into it. So that, that's what I worry, that you're not really getting a distinct position, epistemic position. OK, I, I, I'll, I'll take that on board. I'm not, I'm, I don't think I entirely agree. I think it actually adds to the particularist case to say, look, we can draw in lots and lots of different types of evidence, but we still have to deal with each individual conspiracy theory as it comes across us, mm -hmm. just that there are lots of ways to get information for that evidential weighting. What we can't do is from the information we get about the gen general world is make any claim that conspiracy theories th 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 are irrational to believe prima facie. So there, there don't appear to be any generalists who claim we should believe all conspiracy theories. Even David Icke uh, has a list of conspiracy theories he doesn't believe because they're inconsistent with his worldview. Uh, so in 2012, when he gave his first talk in Auckland for 14 years, he said, look, I don't believe that the main, the main doomsday prophecy of December 20, 2012 has any weight behind it because it's entirely inconsistent with all my other beliefs about what's happening with the world. So even he's able to reject particular claims. Oh, thanks, Matthew. Um, can I just have a look at slide six? Certainly. Uh, is slide six actually slide six? Let's find out. That one, yeah, it's gone past it. No, oh. one which had six. At the top. Oh, sorry, yeah, sorry. You, you mean... Yeah. Yeah, all right, Se uh, section six, that yeah, one that there. One. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I was just thinking um, uh, why we need to ask these questions in particular. I can sort of see why uh, one, three, and four. The second one... Is kind of a variation yeah. of, of one or two? Yeah, no, I was just thinking... Look, the second one seems to be pointing to a, a certain kind of political or cultural or, or social ideal, and I'm just a little bit wary of it as an ideal. Um, I think it was Thomas Paine said the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Um, it seems to be pointing towards a future or some idealised society in which we can finally stop being vigilant <laughs> and we can just chill out. Um, and isn't that you know going to be a self-defeating ideal in the end? Uh, if you have that kind of political culture, if you have those kinds of social arrangements, where on the whole it's rational to trust politicians, uh, that will be easily exploitable uh, and politicians and others acting in official capacities will be able to um, exploit that situation and return, as it were, to uh, a conspiratorial environment. Yes. So, <laughs> I mean, I guess it seems a somewhat paradoxical situation that if you got into that situation, it would be bad to advertise that you're in that situation. It would be, you'd still want to be encouraging people to be on their guard and untrusting in order to keep that situation going. All right, so there are two There are two answers, one jocular, one serious. We'll get the jocular one out of the way. You've caught me out. I am, in fact, a secret fascist and <laughs> communist, and basically what I want is a political society in which I control all information, yeah. and thus I'll ensure no conspiracies occur. Just trust me, it'll be fine. Uh, yeah, no, you're... I suppose one way to respond to this is that we don't need to talk about engineering society to be a particular political ideal. But we could talk about a theoretical ideal where you might go, well, look, in a society that looks like this, we would have grounds for, say, trust in the establishment or complete distrust in the establishment. And we can measure our current society against that. So it's not necessarily we must engineer that endpoint. But if we could show what a truly unconspired society looks like, that could be useful for then working out what it is about our society that allows people to conspire in the background. And presumably this is what people in political science do when they're trying to generate, well, how can we have a freedom of information system that works? What's the ideal version of a world where all information is released automatically after 30 days and computers do the redaction? And what systems will there be in place to make sure that that system isn't abused in any way, shape, shape or form? And then from that, we get our realistic 
policy, which is well, we don't have the computer system to do the automated release, but we can get pretty close by this particular thing. Or it turns out we still don't really want people to know about that particular thing, so we engineer things in, in a way. So no, I'm not, I, well, I have political ideals and ideas of what I think a perfect society should look like. I'm not trying to espouse that particular thing. It's more of a measure which allows us to mirror our own society to it and then go, well, look, this is, this is where the differences lie. And surely that's informative as to how we make our judgments and how we go about our investigation. Sure. Yeah. Um, so just on that point, um, I suppose there seems to me like there's two ways that you might trust a political system. Um, you might trust it's the information that it provides you, or you might trust it generally to do the best thing for you. Um, and in the sense that you're talking about now, like constructing an ideal system, I was just supposing, like, would that ideal system be like, I don't know, Plato's Republic might be like a really, really good political government. No, probably not. But like, we're not, we shouldn't trust the government in that system because they constantly lie to you. But they are trying to make the best world for everyone. So I was just wondering what, what the idea, would it be about trusting them in that general sense or trusting them specifically about the information they provide? I mean, that's a good question for the sheer fact that even in a world where you've got high trust, with your political establishment, you still need to be incredibly vigilant about any underworld activity happening behind the scenes. Unless you can make some story which guarantees conspiratorial activity can never occur in your society. Even in a high trust world, some people have to be out there being really vigilant about things because some people are still going to conspire or at least there's always the possibility they might be and you need to be on the lookout. So, yeah, I'd say it's not about est establishing a trusting relationship such that you can be complacent. It's about knowing what the level of trust is so that when people make particular claims, wherever you sit on the investigative spectra of who should be doing what, you might go, well, I haven't hit that, th I haven't hit that threshold yet. I've heard this particular claim. The threshold isn't matched for me, but it might be matched for someone else. Huh? up the chain. So an investigative journalist surely investigates claims of malfeasance much more easily than one of us do if we read something in the newspaper. Chris. Um, just to follow up there uh, for one moment, I'm interested in looking at the wording of these, when is it rational for citizens to trust officials, so these are people? What sort of political culture, what sort of arrangements, blah, 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 rational citizens to trust politicians and others acting? Each of these are issues about individual people. And it seems to me it's impossible to answer that, right? When am I, when am I, I would say, I agree, don't distrust everyone. What it's about would, might be is that a system, right? That you have a system of checks and balances, which in the US, for instance, is being eroded, right? And this is the difference between democracies and constitutional democracies. It's got nothing to do, in a sense, with the people behind it, um, thank God, in a way, because we can, it's that thing, anyone who wants power is precisely the person you don't want to have it, but they're operating within a system with, in, in which that, that power is given a check. So I'm, I'm interested in the phrasing of these things always in terms of, I mean, and this is, a, this is what conspiracy is always about people, individuals, right? And there's no structural explanation here, poverty. There's no, there's no general ideas about class. I mean, sociology seems to just run out the door here. Um, and any demographic kind of information. And here we don't even have governmental structure. So I'm wondering whether these kinds of questions can be answered simply by invoking um, individuals, I guess. One more thing. And then yep. I'll show right. you. Yep. The second thing, I was interested in you, you, the thing about putting out outlandish examples of you know, gin and psych psychopathic people right at the end of you. And it's true, right? It, every second night on the news there's a cure for cancer. Um, of course, and this evaporates quickly. The difference, I guess, and this is, it's not, it may not be a, an epistemological difference, but there's an ethical difference between saying, well, maybe, you know, gin and psych, psychopathy, right, that might get someone looking across the room at their partner a little suspiciously but it's probably not going to have huge effects. Whereas if you say, oh, and there's, there's this idea that these are, the, um, the Jews are out and they're ruining it for everyone, just an idea, putting it forward to, for consideration, we're not sure, but a number of people believe that. Either. Now, the, it, it would seem that that's a far riskier 
the, the, the epistemological stakes might be the same. I mean, this is Reed's answer to Hume, in a way, against evidentialism. Um, the, the, it's even if epistemologically the same, the consequences of messing this up are much graver, I guess. Um, and, yeah, anyway, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so on the first issue, uh, which is on basically my list of questions is far too individualistic, surely there's got to be another thing. Uh, that's in part a consequence of when I was first pitching the project. So this is a list of questions that was in the project and then I pitched it to Bucharest. Uh, I'm a communitarian by nature. I'm a social epistemologist of the kind where I think that the community is the level of inquiry rather than the individual member. It turns out it's much easier to get talk of this going when you talk about what your ob obligation is to talk about community level inquiry stuff here. So I'm on board with the answers actually more on a community level than it is on an individual level. On the second point, uh, which I've written down here, you're kind of talking almost about the, the devil's advocate conspiracist position you might have, where I'm not saying Jews rule the world, but I am saying it's part of a debate we should have, mm -hmm. which is kind of dog whistle politicking mm -hmm. that we're finding with populist leaders. Uh, so you have, you have Pauline Hanson here, which is surprising because I thought she had disappeared and she's come back. Uh, we have our own version, Winston Peters back home. He disappeared for a much shorter amount of time than Pauline Hanson did and has come back. And, he's, and they're both ri riding on waves of popularism based around dog whistling. You know, I'm not saying that all Asians are bad for Australia. What I am saying is that uh, Asians bring bad things into Australia, or at least that's what I've heard, and we need to have a serious debate about immigration policy. And so people are, and so they're, they're whistling about a, a conspiracy. And it seems, you know, in a reasonable society, you should be able to have these discussions. You know, I've heard a particular claim. And yet the consequences of having those discussions are almost exactly the same, in fact probably are exactly the same, as just being an out outright racist about Asian immigration both in Australia and Aotearoa, New Zealand. And yes, I am worried about the way that we frame this kind of discourse. Because surely, this is the point that Lee Basham keeps on pushing, in an academic context, we need to have those particular types of discussions to investigate them, to understand what motivates them, and also whether it actually might amazingly turn out to be true. But at the same time, we don't want these to be societal discussions because there are horrible consequences. Look at what's happening to large numbers of Polish people in the UK post the Brexit vote, where you've got a large upswing in racist attacks upon Pol Polish people with telling them to move out. And so there needs to be some way of finessing this talk. And also, and yet, as soon as you start talking about finessing that talk, we're allowed to talk about it in our closed rooms. That kind of sounds a little bit conspiratorial. We, the educated elite, we can have these discussions, but you, the hoi polloi, don't talk about that stuff. And that seems kind of threatening. Uh, I, I mean, is it possible to say, if, if someone said, I want to bring up the idea that black people are inferior again, it's a discussion we have to have if you want to put that down. One surely could lament that this has become a question for discussion. Yes. Even if you allow it, you could say, I'm set, you could be fully committed, realist, open inquiry, yes, but you could, I think, legitimately be sad that this has come up, that this has become a question again, right? Um, and I'm not sure that that implies a uh, kind of a, you know, the republic or a kind of quashing of popular discussion. I think. Yeah, no, no, that's a that's a really nice point. We can signal things in a variety of, of different ways. Mm. Um, I just get one quick one. Um, I had a quick question, um, hopefully quick, about the category of the unthinkable. Yep. Um, if you want to talk about epistemically disreputable um, sources here, I have a, a friend of a friend story. Um, about <laughs> Is it really a friend of a friend? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> now. 
um, about an American being told about the Jimmy Savile case. And, you know, oh, yeah, much loved yeah. children's entertainer who turned out to be this rapacious pedophile. Well, that and David Icke was right about, I, sh I, I should add. He's actually right about this. Yeah. Probably the only thing he's ever been right about. He was right about Savile. Was he because he was involved in journalism? I have a feeling, yes. He probably had heard rumours in the corridors of the BBC. Yeah. So then... Yeah, yeah, and also ignored. So um, the story is that an American was told about this, you know, much loved children's entertainer who turned out to be this pedophile, was then shown a picture of Jimmy Savile and said, okay, that's a pedophile, where's this much loved children's entertainer? Um, like, of course, what the hell, look at him. Mm. Um, now, obviously, make that what you will, but my point is about the diachronic character of the unthinkable and retrospective, the retro, retrospective character, potentially, of, of the unthinkable as a category, namely that to us it seems unthinkable, the idea of the British establishment in the 1960s and 70s um, actively hushing up um, what Savile was up to. But then we're not living in the British society of the 1960s no. and 70s. Yeah. And so my question is whether, when we talk about that category of the unthinkable... Um, we're backporting stuff. Yeah, into, are we yeah. necessarily kind of imputing a certain set of what is simply not done to an earlier time? And does that then create a kind of epistemic problem in terms of trying to evaluate long-form conspiracy theory, if you like, or historical conspiracy theory? Yes, I, would, I actually would bite the bullet on there. I think it does actually cause an issue. And I mean, you can find lots of examples of things which were acceptable in the 60s. I mean, there's the, I've completely forgotten the case, the case of the prostitute who laid a complaint against the member of the House of Lords, gave her testimony in court. The judge said, well, why should we believe you? You are a lady of the night. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the one, uh, which then led to huge outcry because people were going, yeah, why would we believe the Lord? And But that was because that judge was coming from a time period where he had grown up in a legal system where people who are in the House of Lords are trustworthy. Ladies of the night always lie. Ipso facto, her claims must be false. And so, yeah, there are all sorts of judgments going on, on there where that would, that's ludicrous to us now that someone would ever make that claim. And the longer we go on, hopefully the more ludicrous it will, it will occur to be. But at the time, some people would have got no, that's quite plausible. I mean, he's a member of the House of Lords. Why would you question him? Sorry, I was just picking up on the, on the point before about uh, it being unfortunate that some conversations or debates have started. I mean, it was kind of presented, uh, I mean, we've moved on now, but uh, it was kind of presented as something that comes from populist politics. But I think one case, for example, of that, um, the, the revival of the discussion of torture uh, has not come from populist politics, mm. it's come from elites, it's mm. come from academics, and it's come from... Uh, oh, there's a huge justification and, in and academic it's literature. Down, not, it's not coming up. Mm. Uh, Deacon oh, academics yeah. have been, uh, been involved in that, so, yeah, it's not... I don't think it's really a feature of populism as such. But no, no, I think... I think the conversations, yeah. uh, there are some conversations which should not be had. I think, I, I think in the Hanson and Peter's case, that's... Mm. pop. Populism, but you're quite right. There are lots of examples where it's been pushed down from people of, of going. We would really quite like to be able to force people to tell us what they think, so we will commission reports to show that actually it's not torture; it's enhanced interrogation or waterboarding. Isn't that bad? Some of them actually enjoy it and <laughs> things of that particular kind. And what's really fascinating about all this literature on terrorism. Uh, and, and, ter and how inter ter interrogation is a useful tool is that it ignores 2,000 years of literature going back to ancient Rome where they go, yeah, torture doesn't work. People will say anything if you torture them. So we learnt the lesson about the utility of torture 2,000 years ago and yet it's interesting that human beings continue to want to go, but yeah, but it'll work this time. It's a little bit like the neoliberal economic agenda. Interventions have not worked in the past, but if we just try harder next year, we're bound to get the results that Hayek said we would get. All right. Well, I think lunch hopefully has been served outside, so would you join me in making that event?